I was asked to go over an introduction to heart failure. Um, certainly a broad topic, but I thought what I would do is um, go over heart failure classifications, pathophysiology, and the natural history. We'll talk a bit about the evaluation and then management. And I thought for this uh, setting, I'd break it up into management of acute decompensated heart failure or the acute heart failure syndrome, and then um, the management more in the chronic setting and just sort of give an overview of both that, since you're likely to come into contact with those very early on. Um, <clears throat> the way that I try to focus on the points that we'll go over, I like to bring in the guidelines, both the um, ACC and the HFSA, Heart Failure Society um, of America guidelines for the management of heart failure. And I'll sort of show you that, but there's, uh, that's a great document for the boards. Um, they do ask quite a few questions that are based on guidelines. Uh, so it's good to know them and it, they focus very much on class one recommendations, um, 1A or class three, so sort of uh, harm. Um, in between, uh, you're, you know, you're not expected to sort of understand the nuances as much in, in regard to the boards. But so I will bring up some of those slides as well, just for your uh, reference. So I'll briefly start with a case. The 62 year old male presents with a complaint of shortness of breath for the past four weeks. He also reports ankle edema. He has a history of coronary artery disease as well as atrial fibrillation. And here's a representative parasternal long axis view of the echo uh, that you obtain for further evaluation. So he has a very dilated left ventricle and a significantly reduced ejection fraction. Um, you also see the right side uh, looks uh, hypokinetic as well, so likely biventricular um, uh, dysfunction here with a significantly reduced LV ejection fraction. So thinking about this uh, gentleman, we'll start with just a brief introduction with epidemiology. So there's a huge risk for Americans, especially to develop heart failure over time, about 20% uh, lifetime risk once you reach above the age of 40. There are more than 650,000 new cases of heart failure that are diagnosed annually. And as you've probably heard, as our population increases, there will be an increased number of cases for us to deal with. There's many ways to think about the classification of heart failure. So I'll introduce a couple of these different uh, classification concepts. So one way is based on the etiology, uh, primary uh, cardiomyopathy versus secondary. Uh, so it's sort of something that's an issue with the muscle itself or sort of the makeup of the um, cardiac structure versus secondary. So secondary to a hit, such as uh, coronary artery disease, for example, or a toxin. The other way is, um, or an additional way to sort of classify is based on ejection fraction. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Here is a brief schematic of the way to sort of think about the primary cardiomyopathies. I will be giving a lecture on the different um, primary cardiomyopathies, I think, later in the, in the summer. But this is just a schematic overview. So there can be genetic, mixed, or acquired. And again, we'll delve into these um, a little bit more in the next lecture. For the purposes of today, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, classification based on ejection fraction and focus mostly on reduced ejection fraction. Thinking about secondary causes of cardiomyopathy, there's an endless list of things that can cause cardiotoxicity or um, cardiac dysfunction listed here. Um, <clears throat> you'll come in contact with many of these, but it is important to keep many of the more rare uh, potential etiologies on your radar. Um, so that you think about looking for those uh, etiologies when you encounter patients. Okay, so the definitions of heart failure with reduced DF and preserved DF um, are uh, classified here. So we technically call heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and EF less than 40%. Um, 
Um, that's also called systolic heart failure. And the reason for this is that many of the trials that have described the medications that are useful and should be prescribed in patients with heart failure with a low EF have used the cutoff of less than 40%. So that's the area in which we uh, focus and which we know medications have effect at this point. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is uh, ejection fraction above 50%. So certainly that leaves a gap here of about 10%. So we do also have this concept, heart failure of, with preserved ES borderline ejection fraction is sort of this intermediate group, 41 to 49%. Um, other times it will be referred to as heart failure with, quote, mid-range ejection fraction. And I would say that clinically, it's not 100% clear sort of what to do with those patients because they don't technically fall into the um, reduce the F category, so we're not necessarily starting uh, certain therapies, that which we'll go over, so guideline-directed medical therapies. Um, and they may be sort of, you know, having a decline in their ejection fraction and heading towards reduced DF, but at what point do we sort of think of them in that manner and start particular medication? So this is sort of the mid-range and um, <clears throat> uh, borderline zone or gray zone. There's also a concept of heart failure with uh, preserved EF improved, or sometimes heart failure with reduced EF improved, um, you'll run into these folks quite a bit. They had a reduced ejection fraction below 40% at one point in time and had improvement to now above 40%. And it's important to understand that they, to refer to them this way and understand clinically that they previously had a reduced ejection fraction because we presume clinically that the reason that their ejection fractions now improved is because of some therapy that we've given them, often the guidelines directed medical therapy or revascularization, for example. So in the case of the guideline directed medical therapy, we continue that uh, knowing that the patient had a reduced ejection fraction previously. So that's an important uh, group to keep uh, to be aware of and we'll go over that concept of the medications and continuing them in detail later. So the heart failure prevalence um, increases with age certainly um, above the age of 60 you start to see a much higher prevalence and then 80 plus which are many of our patients particularly in this um, population at UConn Health where they fall. Um, as we get older, it's more common to be present in females than males. This is not broken down by um, ejection fraction, just sort of overall, um, overall numbers. So recent trends in heart failure related mortality is important to have a sense of. So we had, this is depth here across this green line. Um, and we have seen a decline in the death rate over the um, early 2000s, but then based on this, um, where to go, uh, NHANES data, uh, we do see that there has been an increase in heart failure related mortality over the more recent past. So it's still a focus of um, uh, population health and uh, treatment, um, something that we do not have necessarily uh, controlled. Okay, the pathophysiology, I didn't put the reference in here yet, this is from Brenwald. Um, pathophysiology of heart failure, you can think of it as sort of, you know, heart failure itself is a syndrome, so a collective a collection of symptoms with congestion, lower extremity edema, shortness of breath. And I sort of think of it as the end common pathway for many uh, potential insults to the heart. So there's this, and then this is um, uh, displayed here in this way. So there's an index event, whether it be ischemia um, or um, a toxin, for example. And then there's secondary damage that occurs over time, as well as the body's own compensatory mechanism for the uh, cardiac dysfunction that progresses over time and leads eventually to the syndrome of heart failure. And over that time period, this uh, graph is displaying that a patient will progress from being asymptomatic to then being symptomatic with this presentation of heart failure syndrome. So there's some period of time in which they're quite asymptomatic and from the heart failure standpoint can even include this early index event and early damage, but then over time, because of the compensatory mechanisms and ongoing damage, they become symptomatic. 
the index event here, um, pictorialized underneath, uh, is shown here, and then the body's uh, effects that come into play and worsen damage over time includes neurohormonal activity, and this is where many of our medications are targeted, um, endothelial activity, um, which leads to vasoconstriction, structural change, cy change cytokine release, and then secondary damage. Um, which again, we saw up here, and what does that include? So LV remodeling, hypertrophy of the ventricle, apoptosis, et cetera. So it's a um, sort of downward spiral um, to progressive heart failure. Looking at the pressure volume curve, essentially you see here this normal um, pressure volume curve, and this shifts to the right with uh, heart failure syndrome where you have increased stiffness and increased end diastolic pressure um, for a given volume. And um, this results in a decreased stroke volume, which we look at by looking at this distance here, and overall a decreased blood pressure. So it's a shift to the right uh, in, in the heart failure syndrome that we see. Particularly in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, um, this is the common um, remodeling that we see. So this is a centric remodeling where essentially in an effort to decrease the wall stress that's caused by the increased pressure within the ventricle, the radius of the cavity increases and the thickness of the wall decreases. And this is all in an effort, again, to decrease the wall stress. So this is a centric remodeling, which is often what we see um, in these patients with heart failure with reduced EF. The natural history of heart failure syndrome, I actually draw this out for patients quite a bit, patients and families. Um, it's a busy slide, but the concept here is that um, you know, you have some onset of heart failure here where you might have this large event, so a decline in quality of life, which correlates with an increase in intensity of care, often correlating to a hospitalization, for example, for acute heart failure. And then the patient improves, is sort of tuned up, as we, as we often say, diaries improves clinically and gets back to sort of some level of improved quality of life, but never really gets back to that prior uh, level of quality of life or, or low level of intensity of care. So they continue on this sort of settle downward uh, trajectory until uh, another exacerbation or decompensation occurs. And again, this correlates with an increase in intensity of care. This is often, again, a hospitalization for acute heart failure. And then again, tuned up, diuresed, improve over time, but again, never back to this prior level of which uh, they previously were functioning. So these are the decompensations or admissions that increase usually in frequency over time. Along the way, you can have acute events that can result in death anywhere in this pathway. So you can have sudden death at any point. Um, sorry about that. Um, pump failure occurs at sort of this end uh, common pathway after multiple uh, uh, decompensation events, you can ultimately descend into pump failure and ultimately death from that standpoint. This picture, uh, picture overall is intended to bring our awareness to the overall sort of natural course of the disease and think sooner than this end common place of pump failure Think about where does the patient fall along this course, and at what point does it make sense to either introduce things such as mechanical circulatory support, transplantation, or if the patient is not a candidate for those sorts of things, at what point does thinking about palliative care make sense? Because as you can see, progression and decompensations over time. Um, <clears throat> All right, so we'll move on to the heart failure evaluation, and here I will introduce a bit of some of the guidelines that are, that are good to know. Um, so Heart Failure Society of America um, has uh, thorough guidelines on management and um, here discussing evaluation of the patient presenting with heart failure. So in the initial presentation, it's important to assess clinical severity and functional limitation and then determining the functional class, which we'll discuss. Um, assessing cardiac structure and function, and um, we'll talk about how we do that. 
determining the etiology of heart failure is something important. And so in all, you know, all of my notes when I see heart failure patients, I try to describe, um, you know, the etiology, the functional class, and volume status, which we'll talk about, um, as well as the medication. So the initial evaluation often involves evaluating for coronary artery disease and myocardial ischemia, which is the most, leading, most common leading cause of heart failure in this country. And then evaluating for the risk of life-threatening arrhythmia that could cause sudden cardiac death. So thinking about particularly in patients with HEF-REF or reduced EF, at what point an ICD is, is indicated. We identify any exacerbating factors for heart failure and then comorbidities, which can influence, failure, uh, influence the therapy we introduce. And finally, it's very important to identify any barriers to adherence and compliance. So the initial heart failure visit um, is very extensive. There's a lot of things to cover, uh, as you can see. So let's break down the... Dr. Tatawai, can I... Yep. yep. A quick question and a comment. I want to make sure you agree with me. So a common yeah. mistake I see when uh, with hospitalized patients is that people judge their um, functional status based on the timing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, technically, anybody admitted is going to be asymptomatic and will meet NYHA 3 or 4 classification. But I think we should uh, uh, tailor our classification to their baseline to their, when they're mm -hmm. in their best shape. So not during hospitalization. Is that- Absolutely uh, is, agree. All right. Yeah, absolutely agree. So I think that the, the functional class is more of a sort of chronic measure over time to compare how patient is doing over time, right? Or how the disease is progressing. It's not, as you're indicating, um, something to sort of describe an acute exacerbation. At that point, we know the patient is probably going to have symptoms at rest, right, and be significantly volume overloaded. Um, so you're right, that is not the time to, um, to sort of comment on the NYHA class unless you're going to say at baseline, class two comes in with symptoms of worsening shortness of breath. All right, so then the Heart, New York Heart Association class, as we introduced here, um, four classes, one, two, three, four. The way that I sort of think about it is class one is essentially no limitation of physical activities, really no symptoms. Um, class two can walk up a one or two flights of stairs pretty easily, but then starts to have some symptoms. Class three, no symptoms at rest, but you ask them to go upstairs and they'll have symptoms due to that, even just with one flight. And then class four are symptoms at rest. That's sort of how I think about these. Um, classifications. And they're important, number one, to comment on how a patient has been doing uh, their trajectory over a point of, over a period of time. And then additionally, for thinking about medication um, indication. So NYHA class one oftentimes is uh, sort of separate from adding on or layering on some of these additional medications we use in patients with HEFRES when they're asymptomatic, but once they get into the class two or symptomatic range, then that opens up for um, the use of more medications. Class four is often excluded from trials um, for sort of improvement in heart failure outcome because they are so far sort of advanced on their uh, spectrum of disease. Um, so that's really the two reasons that this is helpful for a trajectory of a patient's clinical course over time and then use for medications. I won't delve too much into the biomarkers, but I do want to discuss, you know, this has been sort of a hot topic, maybe more when I was um, training in fellowship, um, thinking about biomarkers and the evaluation of heart failure. So um, pre-pro-BMP here is something that is, uh, you know, protein that's released uh, when there's stretch of the myocardium, which thus would indicate that there's um, volume overload and increased pressure within the uh, cavities. This is cleaved into NT pro BNP and then the active metabolite BNP. We can measure both of these. The NT pro BNP is uh, cleared more slowly than BNP, and that's why the um, uh, the the numbers are higher um, when we check these for um, for the for lab values. Uh, and it sort of just depends on the capability of the center as to which one is, is checked. Here we check, I think most often, BNP. This can be done in-house 
NP pro BNP needs to be sent out. It's a bit more expensive. So, um, you know, prior trials used BNP as a marker to follow for uh, improvement with therapies. NP pro BNP is sort of increasingly uh, being used in more recent trials. So biomarkers have been a hot, to hot topic. Um, I think there's very uh, specific indications in which to use biomarkers. So BNP and NC pro BNP can be useful to support clinical judgment for heart failure, essentially. So you can use it to help support your clinical diagnosis of heart failure or to potentially sort of exclude heart failure. There's some data that shows you can follow it in chronic ambulatory heart failure. We don't necessarily always do that, um, but that's possible. Uh, there's some data to support that. It's often used in acute decompensated heart failure to sort of help guide um, the presentation uh, and sort of where the patient falls on their on a spectrum of, of uh, volume status. It's not necessarily, there is not necessarily data to sort of follow um, these biomarkers over the course of a hospitalization. And I think the most helpful area in which um, these biomarkers can be used is if you have sort of an unclear etiology of dyspnea. Um, it has a pretty high negative predictive value. It can be useful um, to rule out heart failure when the BNP is truly below 100. Um, again, in the appropriate uh, clinical context, keeping in mind that um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, these patients may not be always congested. They may not always have an elevated uh, biomarker um, such as BNP or NP pro BNP. And then also keeping in mind that obesity does um, uh, potentially lower the BNP than what you would expect. So again, I think the concept here in the appropriate clinical context can be used can be helpful to sort of rule out with it has good negative predictive value, um, but not the sort of end all be all. And here's another reason why, you know, we shouldn't put full stock into um, these measurements outside of the clinical context. There are many causes for release of natriuretic peptides. I sort of think of it as a um, um, sort of like a stress response factor. So you can have this release here of critical illness sepsis, um, toxic metabolic insults, just with advancing age alone, you can have a uh, release of nutritic peptides. So it needs to be used in, in the appropriate context. Okay, so recommendations for non-invasive cardiac imaging, um, just so that you can sort of see here, um, if patient has new acute or new onset heart failure, a chest X-ray is indicated. Echocardiogram is sort of your initial go-to imaging modality for evaluation of ejection fraction. Um, repeat measurement of EF is indicated really only if the patients have had a significant change in their clinical status or have received some kind of therapy that may have improved their function over time or if it's time to reassess ejection fraction to think about, for example, ICD placement. We do not do routine yearly echoes, for example. There's no indication to do that. So there needs to be a, a clinical reason it's gonna sort of change your therapy strategy for this patient with known heart failure, or there has been a change in clinical status. Um, <clears throat> then there's some more comments here. So this is the concept that I just commented on. Routine repeat measurement of LV function assessment should not be performed. Um, and that's where we, you know, we don't sort of just update the, uh, the echo, for example. Um, Non-invasive imaging to detect myocardial ischemia and viability is reasonable in heart failure with CAD. I would say that this is something that, you know, you should evaluate for ischemia in new uh, heart failure whether you do it with uh, non-invasive imaging or invasive evaluation um, can, be, can be debated. And then MRI is often a very helpful tool that is uh, obtained after echocardiogram. Again, echo is your go-to for imaging modality. And um, we won't get into sort of all the specific details of when to use MRI, but can be very helpful here. My, myocardial infiltration, SCAR, um, uh, hypertrophic, um, pathophysiology that can be very helpful for, for infiltrative uh, disease as well. Okay, invasive evaluation. We'll briefly touch on this, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about pulmonary artery catheter as well. 
Um, but basically, the indication for invasive hemodynamic monitoring is pretty narrow. So patients with respiratory distress or impaired systemic perfusion when your clinical assessment is deemed to be inadequate. So it's not clear, is this septic shock, is this cardiogenic shock, or you're giving some sort of therapy for heart failure and the patient's not improving, that falls under the purview of using a pulmonary artery catheter. And we'll talk a, t a brief more about that when we get into the acute heart failure syndrome. Um, <clears throat> When ischemia may be contributing to heart failure, angiography is reasonable. Um, only very specific indications for when endomyocardial biopsy is indicated. So essentially a patient um, that's, that's really not improving with your initial therapies or a thought that the patient might have a certain type of um, heart failure that can respond to specific therapies. So mainly is it, is, if it's a steroid responsive myocarditis type of presentation. So very narrow window again for endomyocardial biopsy. It's not something that's routinely done. And then here, just to highlight the class three indications. So routine use of invasive hemodynamic not monitoring, not recommended in normal intensive patients. And then endomyocardial bio biopsy should not be performed in routine evaluation. So the two the class three to keep in mind. All right, follow-up visit is, um, is also potentially quite involved. You could spend quite a, quite a bit of time on your follow-up visit. But again, you sort of want to reassess the functional capacity. Hopefully by now you've got a good sense of what the etiology of the heart failure is. Go over any changes in body weight, um, any changes in symptoms, and then reassessing compliance at each visit is very important. Um, you can go over at the follow-up visits as well. Um, you know, if, if there's been an improvement in injection fraction, if there's any uh, indication for moving forward with device therapies, et cetera. Um, I always comment on, um, again, the NYHA class, um, the volume status of the patient, and then the, the therapies um, or GDMT that they're currently on for HEFRAF, and if we've considered device-based therapy or any further sort of uh, more advanced evaluation. Okay, so let's talk a bit about management. This is sort of just for the 2013 um, ACC AHA guidelines for the management of heart failure. So this is the most updated full document. There is a 2017 update, um, which I'll briefly introduce as well, but this is just for your reference the document um, that you can refer to. So acute heart failure syndrome. So let's talk a little bit about that. Again, now, now we're going to break it up a little bit into the acute heart failure syndrome versus chronic heart failure um, presentation and management. So acute heart failure is really, again, a heterogeneous syndrome with multiple pathophysiologies that may require targeted therapy, and that's a way to think about it. Your relief of symptoms is your import, main important goal in the, in the acute heart failure presentation. And keeping in mind that acute heart failure hospitalization is really a marker of high risk, I'll draw you, I'll remind you back of that um, schematic that I presented of the natural history of heart failure, where over time these decompensations or heart failure hospitalizations really change the overall sort of slope of the patient descending into essentially pump failure. So data has shown to support this as well that poor post-discharge outcome um, is really present uh, despite evidence-based therapy. So it's just really a marker of, of poor, poor prognosis, unfortunately. So the pathophysiology of acute heart failure, super busy slide, um, but the ones to keep in mind here are these that are green, super helpful. So vasoconstriction is a very common component of the presentation of acute heart failure. Um, due to ischemia, you often will have an increase in diastolic dysfunction, um, which contributes to poor filling and um, pulmonary edema. There's a decline in LV contractility, again, from uh, often from ischemia, as well as increase in wall stress and multiple other um, um, insults. Renal dysfunction is also a, a large component of the um, pathophysiology of acute heart failure. So fluid and salt water retention, um, which again can be worsened by uh, vasoconstriction. Um, so these are the sort of main components to, to keep in mind that we are uh, dealing with. There's common um, things that we know can precipitate acute heart failure uh, decompensations, and this is just a list of, of some of the more common etiologies or triggers. 
Non-adherence is a big one, often with sodium or fluid restriction. Myocardial schema is always on our radar. Um, hypertension, uh, again, is a, is a big one. So there's a huge list um, and always want to keep in mind a broad differential as to what the potential trigger may be. I think it's helpful to sort of separate because, um, you know, acute heart failure syndrome, just like heart failure syndrome um, more broadly, is a collection of symptoms it, and is often an end common pathway for a prison, patient's presentation. It's not necessarily, um, you know, one, uh, one pathophysiology that leads to this presentation. So it can be helpful when thinking about how to treat uh, treat these patients to sort of group them into um, subsets of patient populations or of sort of um, clinical presentations. So this is one way to sort of think about it. So a patient presenting with elevated blood pressure as one of their is sort of their prominent clinical symptom with heart failure is uh, is um, uh, indicate. Um, present about a quarter of the time in acute heart failure syndromes, and then that leads you to uh, have a, a clinical target of blood pressure and volume ma management with uh, vasodilators. Normal or moderately elevated blood pressure is another large group. Um, the target here would be volume management and plus minus vasodilators. There's the patients with low blood pressure, uh, flash pulmonary edema is its own subset, um, cardiogenic shock, ACS uh, or ischemia, and then isolated right-sided heart failure. Um, so this is one way to think about the general presentation and then be able to target the therapies um, appropriately. So we talked about identifying therapeutic targets and thinking about the patient's subset by symptoms. Another way to categorize them in your mind is to say that, um, you know, the great majority of patients presenting with acute heart failure syndrome are going to have fluid overload, congestion, and edema, and they're going to have increased filling pressure. So that's going to be your main target, and that's most of the patients you'll come across. A small minority will have a syndrome of low output and reduced cardiac output. So the, uh, you know, the nuance there is, is figuring out uh, who this small minority is with a low output type syndrome and then treating the great majority with, um, with basically increased filling pressures. So this is a, um, a way to uh, do this uh, hemodynamic assessment and just understand in the acute heart failure syndrome uh, which you're dealing with. So <clears throat> this is from um, Dr. Lynn Warner Stevenson um, up at the Brigham. This is a two minute hemodynamic assessment which you can sort of do right at the bedside. And the two questions that you want to sort out um, to be able to sort of phenotypically classify how this patient is presenting is, is there, is there evidence of low perfusion or that, or are they in this, you know, small minority with a low cardiac output and is there congestion? Okay. So we often talk about these patients as um, warm and dry. So they're not congested and they have, uh, do not have evidence of low perfusion, warm and wet which is probably, again, the majority of patients here. So they have congestion, but no evidence of low perfusion. Cold and wet, um, so evidence of low perfusion and evidence of uh, congestion, and then cold and dry. So evidence of poor perfusion and no evidence of congestion. So I would say this here is your most sort of dire, and you want to recognize these patients that are in the cold and dry category. There's unfortunately not much that we can do for these folks because as you can see, uh, just with our sort of routine medical therapies, they don't have any congestion that we can improve and their main presentation is this low perfusion, which we need to come up with um, a, a long-term sort of strategy for that. Cold and wet is, um, is something we can work with and warm and wet, obviously warm and dry is the best, but they wouldn't be presenting likely to you um, with an acute heart failure syndrome, but warm and wet is sort of the best because we can we can work with that. The things to think about for evidence of congestion is the patient telling you about orthopnea, elevated JVP on examination, um, about a quarter to a half will have edema, so not everybody. Uh, pulsatile hepatomegaly is something to look out for, ascites. Rails are often present, though in chronic heart failure, you likely will not see them. 
or hear them. Um, evidence for low perfusion. So we talk about this a lot on rounds and I'm um, with you guys on rounds and narrow pulse pressure. So if that pulse pressure, the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure is less than 25, that correlates very closely with a low cardiac output or an index, cardiac index of less than 2.2. Are the extremities cool? And then do they have symptoms of uh, low output, sleepy or obtunded? Um, you know, the brain uh, needs blood, obviously. So a low output state can present with altered mental status or confusion. You can suspect this if there's a history prior to the presentation that the patients had to sort of back off on their beta blocker ACE inhibitor in that patient setting because their blood pressures were becoming lower. So this is an updated version of that uh, old, this is old, right? But it, nothing's changed here. It's just that this is a little bit updated in the sense that we think about, I like that it adds in sort of thinking about which size or which ventricle is really affected. And I think we forget about the right ventricle a lot. And that's something that we really want to think about in the acute setting because you're going to think a little bit differently about right, just sort of right heart failure, for example, in the setting of a large PE or pulmonary hypertension, a little bit differently than you would think about left-sided failure. So just to introduce this concept, we could do a whole talk on this alone, um, but just throw in there thinking about what side are you dealing with. And here's your goal of therapy. So if you're here in this sort of cold and wet area, you want to get back to here, right? Warm and dry. If you want to diurese, you want to augment cardiac output if you can. If you're here, warm and wet, that's great. You can diurese and get them back to the warm and dry concept. The cold and dry is the tougher one because we, we can't really diurese. There's not really any room for diuresis. And, um, you know, we, we need to think more in the sort of long-term strategy as to how we can support cardiac output. All right. So just a few things to keep in mind with acute heart failure presentation. Um, fluid retention may be subtle or difficult to assess. So if there's not any rails or crackles on chest exam, um, focus more on the patient's sort of symptoms of shortness of breath or orthopnea. Because in chronic heart failure, you often have um, compensation um, for uh, the pulmonary edema, so you may not see uh, pulmonary edema on x-ray or, or hear it on exam. If there's a lack of fetal edema, think about looking for ascites. Um, and if it's just keeping in mind that it's very common to sort of hide fluid when a patient is larger. So greater than 180 pounds, it can be a patient can easily sort of hide a fluid in their abdomen, um, and and the exam can be a little bit more challenging. Okay, some concepts of on low output syndrome. These symptoms will often sort of resemble a viral illness. So there'll be patients will often complain of feeling fatigued, often just fatigue at rest. Very common presentation is abdominal distension and GI symptoms. So um, this is due to gut edema. Um, they'll sort of have early satiety often or nausea, um, difficulty eating. Those are common symptoms that, um, you know, these patients often end up with an um, abdominal ultrasound to look at their liver and look at their gallbladder, and usually it's really just to, due to edema. Um, Often congestion is absent, but the patient will still complain of orthopnea, um, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and you may see that x-rays actually unchanged, but they have these symptoms that are present and that you need to attend to. All right, therapies for the heart failure patient. We won't go through this um, in detail, but this is there for you to sort of review. We'll break it down like this. Management is essentially think about diuretics, vasodilators, and ionotropes. So the diuretic strategy um, you know, I think this is a, help, a helpful schematic, but basically IV loop diuretics early. There was a study that looked at sort of door to diuretic time, and it didn't really make a difference in the, in the outcomes, but you don't want a patient to, that's only admitted for heart failure to be um, sitting around not getting diuresed, uh, you know, early on in their admission. Um, Initial dose recommendations are here, so usually one to two and a half times the total daily oral loop diuretic. Um, and you want to think about prescribing IV diuretics um, more than once a day. So often the, the medicine service will, it'll be like IV Lasix 20 milligrams 
Q day. And we can be more effective than that in most cases, especially if the, if the um, renal function is normal and the blood pressure allows, um, you know, we, we can and should be more aggressive with that. You monitor the symptoms. If you're improving, you sort of continue with your plan. If there's initial improvement and then the improvement in diuresis is stalled, then you escalate your diuretic. So you either increase the dose, you add another agent such as metolazone or diaril, um, and then you reassess. And if they're worsening, then we sort of have to change our plan. So consider other strategies for decongestion. Do they need dialysis at the sort of end of that spectrum? Consider thinking about hemodynamic monitoring. This is the indication where a pulmonary artery catheter would be, catheter would be helpful, inotropes and advanced therapies. So that's just a schematic overview. Um, that document with the guidelines does actually show sort of initial dose of diuretic and then max dose, and it can be actually helpful to look at some more details there too. Vasodilators. So we can use vasodilators in combination with diuretics. Um, the two common ones are nitroglycerin and nitroprusside. So nitroglycerin is more of a venodilator. Um, so it will decrease preload pretty significantly. Um, it's very helpful for pulmonary edema. The things to think about is that it can cause tolerance in about 24 hours, in as early as 24 hours in some patients. And then in severely preload dependent patients, again, you do want to have some caution there. So I usually will not use this in severe AS. Um, in, in predominantly right heart failure, you need to be uh, gentle as well. Can cause pretty significant hemodynamic instability. Nitroprusside is another option. This is a venous and arterial dilator has a very short half-life, which is helpful, so you can stop it and get rid of the effect pretty quickly if there's a hypotension. <clears throat> the cautions with nitroprusside are caution with COPD, which can worsen BQ mismatch, and then there's this concept of coronary steel syndrome. I can't say I've encountered that. Um, think about cyanide toxicity, and that's especially something to consider in renal dysfunction, so with sort of longer-term use. So nisiratide, if you go look into the sort of guidelines and even Brunwald's and, and do some um, data digging to, to find the primary data. There's a lot of discussion about nisiratide. Um, it has really fallen out of favor. It's basically a recombinant form of human BNP, which can be given in an IV form. There was a lot of look into this like five, 10 years ago, five to seven years ago, um, to try to prove that uh, this was going to be the most helpful drug in acute heart failure syndrome. And this trial of SendHF, which was published in 2011, was really the end, end game for nisiratide. It's essentially fallen out of favor. I don't even think it's approved in the US any longer. It has a relatively long half-life, so the hemodynamic effects stick around. Um, and one of the hemodynamic effects is pretty significant hypotension. So that was a big issue in this trial. And then there's no mortality benefit over time. So this is really not an option, but you'll see it everywhere, even in the guidelines like that 2000 um, um, in, the, in Brunwald and then some of the older guidelines, it's, it's still mentioned. Um, so just to sort of be aware of that. So in general, thinking about vasodilators, these are helpful for HEFREF. We use them with caution in HEFTEF. They can cause hypotension. So this is really a sort of HEFREF or reduce CF strategy. Okay, inotropes. When should we use that? So here's a statement that sort of brings us back to what is our focus of treatment of the acute heart failure syndrome. So hemodynamic improvement should result from ameliorating myocardial dysfunction rather than from myocardial stimulation that can result in further injury. And inotropes are exactly that. They're myocardial stimulation. They'll improve cardiac output um, over a short period of time, but it's almost sort of like, um, I hate this phrase, but like beating a dead horse, basically. So your cardiac muscle is already very dysfunctional, and um, uh, there's a lot of myocardial um, damage occurring in the acute heart failure syndrome. And then when you add on top of that an inotrope, which just increase the, increases the oxygen demand, um, it's really not ideal. So we use inotropic therapy only when absolutely necessary. So when there's a low output scenario in which we really need to improve the cardiac output over the short period of time to be able to either maintain or improve end organ perfusion or to allow for diuresis in patients that are both wet and cold.
All right, when is invasive monitoring appropriate? We briefly talked about this. So monitoring with a PA catheter, again, we said, should be done in patients that have um, respiratory distress or evidence of sort of low output or shock, but we can't really understand clinically what the source is or how to, how to manage it. So could this be septic shock versus cardiogenic shock is the um, classic question. And it's helpful in that scenario to guide your therapy. Um, there were studies um, that showed, again, like 10, 15 years ago that showed, I don't have it here, but um, showed that the outcomes really were no better um, with the use of pulmonary artery catheter, in some cases even even worse. And part of the issue is that, you know, the, the lines themselves, I think we'll talk in more detail at some point in a hemodynamic conference, but, you know, there's certainly risks and potential um, complications of placement and maintenance of a pulmonary, pulmonary artery catheter. And then you get a ton of data that if you don't know sort of how to work through it or the data itself is erroneous because like the, you know, the thing's not zeroed or the box isn't working, which is, you know, logistically the kind of issues that come up. And then you're working off of faulty data and um, it can actually potentially worsen the, the clinical picture or therapy that you're trying to provide. So those are some of the reasons there. So again, I always feel if we're going to use inotropes, then we should know the numbers so that it's warranted, um, as we discussed in that sort of previous study, to minimize the use of inotropes where it's not warranted. Um, and then again, if your clinical picture is not clear and you just don't know how to proceed with your therapy, then it's, then it's appropriate. So what about chronic medications in the acute setting? Um, all the guidelines really support continuing outpatient medications if possible. Um, if there's hemodynamic instability or other contraindications, then uh, certainly we need to, uh, to change them. Um, we don't stop beta blockers when patients come in with acute heart failure syndrome, you know, unless they're hemodynamically unstable or low output and we need to switch strategies to a inotrope type of um, approach. So that's the indication there. So if you can, continue the chronic medications. Um, Entresto is sort of the new kid on the block, and there's a lot of data for using Entresto or angiotensin neprilysin inhibition in chronic heart failure, and the guidelines currently um, support switching patients that have previously tolerated ACE or ARB onto Entresto. There is more data, and I showed this slide just to highlight that there is now um, newer information. I think this was just published 2019 to suggest that it can be safe and effective to start Entresto in hospitalized patients um, and new diagnosis of heart failure. So I imagine that this will become uh, part of the guidelines as well, but just something to uh, be aware of that Entresto, we actually do have some support from the data to use that right off the bat, rather than what we used to do, which was wait until the patient was stabilized, tolerating an ACE or ARB, and then switch them. So, <clears throat> It's important to focus on congestion. Uh, that's usually the, uh, you know, the symptoms that the patient presents with is due to their congestion. The reason for the hospitalization, again, the majority of the time is because patients are congested. We don't do a great job. This data sort of shows that uh, during a hospitalization, we tend to not do a very good job of actually fully achieving um, the goal of dealing with congestion. So. We have some data here that, that shows that about 15, 16% of acute heart failure patients are discharged with actually weight gain or no change in their weight over the course of their hospitalization. And then if we ask patients about their symptoms, less than half are actually asymptomatic by the time they leave the hospital. And uh, the other large majority, 40%, are improved, but they're still symptomatic. So we don't actually do a very good job of, of um, addressing congestion during hospitalization. And it's important because hospitalizations, as I mentioned earlier, are really a poor uh, predictive factor. Um, mortality really increases over time after hospitalizations. And you can see here with the number of hospitalizations as well as with age, median survival over um, you know, the years after the hospitalization really declines. So if you have a patient over 85 with multiple or four hospitalizations over the past year, their median survival is less than a year. So I, I get involved in a lot of patient care in the hospital where patients on their third heart failure hospital admission, you know, they're at the end of that um, 
graph that I showed in the beginning of the natural history and their median survival is really looking like less than half a year and the patient and family sort of don't understand the gravity of their overall situation. So it's just something to keep in mind, sort of the broad picture when we're seeing these patients in, in, uh, in the uh, hospital setting. They die of heart failure after they're hospitalized or sudden cardiac death. Those are sort of the two most common causes. So things to be aware of um, when you're seeing patients in the hospital. So I know I'm have like two minutes left. I think this talk is probably twice as long as I as it should have been. Um, next, what I was going to talk about is basically post discharge and outpatient management. And this is could be again its own separate talk on um, chronic therapies for for heart failure, heart failure with reduced CF. I'll just draw your attention to a few main slides. Um, let's see here. So the stages of heart failure um, are important. Again, another way to sort of slice up the heart failure patients and think about them from a um, classification standpoint. And the reason why it's important is because that dictates sort of our management. So thinking about st the, the stages of heart failure, stage A is at risk, but no structural abnormality. And that um, is basically we focus on prevention of heart failure in those scenarios. Stage B, structural heart disease, um, but no signs or symptoms of heart failure. So this could be a patient that's had an MI in the past, um, has some valvular disease, but they don't actually have heart failure symptoms. And again, we focus on um, prevention and in some patients consider ACE and ARB. Stage C is where a lot of the guidelines focus on with the guideline-directed medical therapy, um, structural heart disease with prior or current symptoms of heart failure. So anytime you've had a heart failure sort of presentation, you're going to continue to be in this stage C category, even if you go back to being an asymptomatic person. So um, prior or current symptoms. Sorry, I'm having Oops. trouble hearing you. My watch can't hear me. Um, so this is where guideline-directed medical therapy comes into play. And I'll show you briefly just to end a slide on that. Um, and then stage D is refractory heart failure requiring specialized intervention. So these are the patients that you either need to, you know, they're beyond the stage of these guideline-directed medical therapy strategies with plans to improve their function and mortality over time. They're past that. So now we're thinking about, is this an appropriate patient to think about mechanical circulatory support or transplants, or is it an appropriate patient to think about end-of-life care and sort of hospice therapy? Um, I would just want to go through, um, this is, this is one of the commonly referred, uh, graphs that talks about the, uh, heart failure therapies for stage C HEFRAS. So the medications that you add, initial class one medication for all patients that have ever been symptomatic or are currently symptomatic, ACE and ARB. And this is still sort of in the guidelines, ACE and ARB. Volume overloaded at diuretics. If they're on an ACE and ARB at um, maximal doses and they're still symptomatic for African Americans in class three and four, we add hydralazine and nitrates. If they're class two to four, they're on their ACE, ARB, and beta blocker, ACE, ACE or ARB and beta blocker, and their renal function and potassium permits, then we add an aldosterone antagonist. Um, so that's just the overview. So we always start with this base of ACE are beta blocker, and now Entresto is included there as well. And then we layer on as appropriate, and I'll draw your attention to the NYHA class as being the state in which we sort of consider adding these particular therapies. So class, then it's different for um, hydrol and nitrates versus um, spironolactone. All right, I think I'll stop there. Um, happy to sort of continue at, at some point too and go over um, in further detail, but I think I'll stop there and see if you guys have any questions or comments. Dr. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, that was a uh, great talk, and you know, we will schedule another um, conference, you know, for the application management. I had a quick question about you know, um, in patients with um, heart failure with mid-range or borderline EF. I know, like you said, in the guidelines, they say um, their pathophysiology seems like more like half PEF, but I think yeah, how would you um, go about this? I think, you know, for, for me, if I see someone with 
around borderline EF, I'd probably, you know, I do an ischemic evaluation, probably put them on some GDMT as well. Uh, but what are your thoughts and how have you been um, going about with your patients? Yeah, I think it, it's tough because there really isn't data there to guide. If you look at the um, indications for all of the meds for GDMT, it's not really indicated in those patients. I think it depends on what we consider the underlying etiology to be. So ischemic eval, absolutely, because they could have um, underlying coronary disease that you want to address, and you may just prevent them by, by um, intervening on, on ischemic disease from progressing further. If it's a patient, which I have a fair amount of these patients that have a gene positive for a dilated cardiomyopathy, and they start to slip down into the 40s to 50% range on their ejection fraction, then I will have a conversation about starting an ACE inhibitor or beta blocker. Um, and then I think it's up to, with a, with a thought of sort of, you know, preventing further um, uh, decline and, and LV remodeling. And I think that's totally indicated. And if it were me, that's what I would want to, to be offered. Um, you run into issues sometimes there with the patients that are, um, you know, young females, maybe wanting to have a pregnancy and those sorts of things. So, so, so it's always a discussion in that range. But I would say I try to think about what the underlying cause is and which way we are headed. Um, and if we can add on some of these medications with pretty low risk and prevent further decline in their ejection fraction, then I'd like to do that. The patients that have, again, that special population of patients that had a lower EF and then now it's above 40%. I didn't get to those slides here, but essentially our, our sort of overall thought has been it makes sense to continue medicines that they were on before because we think that that is what made their ejection fraction better. And we most recently do have data that supports that, that says if a patient had a reduced EF, we put them on GDMT, their EF improved to above 40%, when we start to take away those medications, it's very common that they'll have a, a sort of relapse or, or decline in their EF from there. So, so that group of patients with the EF in the 40% range or so, we just keep it going. I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the great talk, Dr. Tatubai. Uh, one, one quick comment, I think in the Paragon heart failure for the interesto and HFF, those uh, mm -hmm. intermediate uh, uh, range EF behaved uh, like HEFREF, and they had mm -hmm. some benefit from Interesto. But my question is about um, uh, what's your take about following serial pro b and I've seen different practices from heart failure attendings at different hospitals. Some swear by it, some they do it like twice, some they don't even believe in it. <laughs> what do you mm -hmm. think? In the outpatient setting? And no, in the inpatient setting. So I've seen one, uh, some attendings, they do it uh, uh, every day. Some they do it once and then maybe repeat it once before discharge to make sure they achieved uh, the patient back to baseline. And there were actually some attendings, they said like pro BMB doesn't help me. I can like just use my clinical judgment and move on. Yeah, I think so. I was I'm just looking here for this slide because there was a bit of a change in the guidelines um, in 2017 discussing the utility of BNT or NT pro BNT during the hospitalization. So essentially, I think that it is helpful at the time of hospitalization. Um, it, uh, it it has prognostic value. We'll say that. So where it falls at the time of hospitalization has overall prognostic value for the patient. Um, over the short of short to medium term after hospitalization. Um, I think it can be helpful when they present that way, uh, you know, with heart failure and it's not, or with shortness of breath, it's not clear as if their COPD or their heart failure, although it is sort of an acute phase reactant, I think it can be helpful to help guide, do we need to focus more, much more on the diuretic piece of it? I don't follow it during hospital stay. I don't think there's any data to, to um, clearly support doing that. As an outpatient, I'll use it um, intermittently. You know, if a patient has a subtle change in symptoms that I that is sort of hard to know, is this due to could we be more aggressive with diuretic therapy? Then I think a BNT can potentially be helpful in that setting. If it's gone up from whatever their previous number was, then okay, we'll be a little bit more aggressive. But I think that the in general, the use of them is that they should not ever be used in isolation. And I personally do not use it to follow over the course of a hospitalization as to how our diuretic is doing. 
we have many other um, factors and the patient right in front of us as that of which we can follow uh, over that time period. Thank you. I think Manish, ha Manish had a question. Yeah. If you have to, I mean, I have a few questions, but I'll keep it to one or two. Uh, okay. I know there's a slide that said that, you know, like somebody who comes in with volume overload uh, in, in the hospital and, you know, continue the, the beta blocker. The question that I have is, would you at least reduce the dose uh, just to kind of like uh, help with the diagnosis or you would keep them on the same dose? I think if you think that they're uh, low output or they need higher blood pressure to allow for renal perfusion to be able to diurese, then it's definitely reasonable to decrease. But I do not systematically uh, decrease the beta blocker on uh, hospitalization. Okay. And the other question that I have is, I know like there was a slide mentioning about MBO2. Uh, sometimes in ICUs when patients come in with shock, what I use is, and I do not know, I have read about it, I did not get a good picture of it. Sometimes I use to differentiate between if it's a distributive uh, shock or obstructive shock. Uh, I, I check, you know, usually we put in a central line, so I check SCVO2. Could that reliably differentiate or at least tell like it could be septic shock versus cardiogenic shock? Yeah, so the SCVO2 can be helpful, and I would say if you don't have um, a pulmonary artery catheter or if you've had one, you know what the MVO2 and sort of how it correlates to the SCVO2. Mm -hmm. um, and then you remove the PA catheter, but you still have the introducer in place, for example, or just a central line, then it can be useful. I think it's helpful, again, over the course of a trajectory or, and going along with all the other clinical pieces mm -hmm. um, rather than in isolation. And I think that's the, the important part for all of these um, factors is that, again, heart failure is a syndrome. So you have to take into account all of the other factors that you have in your um, available to you to sort of guide the therapy. So, so yes, I think it can be helpful, especially if you previously had an MVO2 and sort of know how that correlates with the SCVO2. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other question I had, like, you know, when we diuretize patients, sometimes their creatinine goes up. Uh, mm -hmm. I have heard different things. Uh, you know, I was talking to Dr. Trivedi who said it's basically because you remove the fluid, so the, it's the hemoconcentration, and that's why creatinine goes up. Uh, some of the tendons say that it's because you diuretize them faster that's what happens because the renal perfusion reduces a little bit. What's your take on that? So I think that sometimes we do diuresis, you know, if you diuresis a little bit more quickly, then mm -hmm. the creatinine can bump. So it's all about fluid shift. You'll have a certain amount of fluid within the intravascular space that you're able to remove, and then it needs to be shifted from the third space back into the um, intravascular space to further diuresis. Mm -hmm. So I will often sort of push forward if, if total body volume uh, appears very volume overloaded, even if the creatinine bumps a little bit, I'll sort of push through that and try to see mm -hmm. if we can mobilize the fluid from the third space into the vasculature to continue to diarrhea. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, um, it's interesting. so Trivedi said that it's because of this sort of total volume that you're measuring the creatinine out of, you've reduced with the diarrhea. Yes, that, that's what he yeah. said. Yeah. That makes sense too. I mean, um, in general, if the renal function is normal to start, then I will diurese until uh, you know it's bumped because then that gives me a sense that either okay, if clinically they look dry and now the creatinine is bumped, then I think we're we're there, we've reached our goal. Mm -hmm. If we don't look like we've reached our goal clinically, but the creatinine bumps, then I might do a little bit more gently, try to allow some time for the um, fluid to. Uh, shift into the vascular space and then continue with trials of diuresis. Mm -hmm. um, if they start off with an abnormal creatinine from their baseline, you know, that often will have people feeling uh, tenu you know, um, cautious about diuresing, but that's often just because the uh, venous, um, the renal venous side is very congested, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't get good renal perfusion. So as you diurese, then the creatinine starts to come down. Um, so that I often try to push through as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, one more question. Do we have time? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, what I have like I have read very mixed data about uh, aggressive viruses versus because when I was a resident, people are always scared. Oh, the goal net negative is one liter. Uh, and I feel like I've read data that if we go for aggressive diuretics, so rather than having someone on 20 milligram twice daily, we put them on say 80 milligram twice daily. It definitely reduces length of stay. 
and different complications depending on like it's half ref or half ref. Uh, what, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? Like, do you think that aggressive diuresis is beneficial or? I think that if you have um, the clinical substrate to allow to be relatively aggressive, then mm -hmm. then we should. You know, there was the dose trial some time ago, which looked yeah. at high bolus versus uh, continuous infusion, and it really didn't show much difference overall. So mm -hmm. I think what I do is, is start with one strategy. It's usually the bolus. Um, <laughs> you should definitely, you know, only last, least it lasts about six hours in the system. So you should at least be doing it twice a day. If mm -hmm. the renal function is normal and you look like you have a lot of fluid to go, then we should just, you know, go forward with relatively aggressive diuresis if the patient can tolerate it. Um, if the renal function is not necessarily normal or the hemodynamics are soft, um, soft blood pressure, then that forces you to go a little bit slower. And then if your strategy doesn't seem to be working is when you switch to thinking about, okay, we need to either be more aggressive or go to a drip mm -hmm. or that sort of thing. So there's constant sort of reassessment. But I think if, if the substrate is there to allow you to be aggressive, then we mm -hmm. should do that because, you know, we want to get the patient feeling better, get them out of the hospital if we can. So if they have normal renal function, normal blood pressure, and the fluid's coming off, then you just keep going, maybe even bump it up a little bit until you reach a, a limiting factor, like the renal function or the blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And what do you think of like using hypotonic saline or high dose steroids in patients who are still diabetic resistant? So I have not used, um, you know, I think I know that there is some new data coming out about hypertonic saline. Um, mm -hmm. I think that if the patient has a renal dysfunction, low blood pressure, and you want to use something that is, um, you know, we've used albumin in the past sometimes as something that's going to potentially stay within the vasculature and just allow for improved renal perfusion and blood pressure, but not distribute into the third space, um, mm -hmm. then I think that's where that concept comes from. But I mm -hmm. haven't used it myself, the hypertonic saline, and definitely not the steroids, but I know that that's, this is the next phase now coming up of looking at diuretic resistance mm -hmm. um, and, and ways to sort of get around that. Because I think all the other studies that have been done up until this point have looked at varying the dose of the diuretic, varying the, the way it's given, whether, whether it's in uh, continuous infusion or bolus, adding on other diuretics. So we haven't really found any way that or even ultrafiltration, we haven't found something that actually sort of fixes this problem. So now we're expanding. I think it's not in common general use yet, but it, but it may be that that's something we can do. Okay. All right. uh, I have more questions. Mansoor will hate me, <laughs> so I'll. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you can ask. Them. You could definitely ask offline. For sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you Can once again, Yeah. Thank All you. Right, you're Bye. Bye. Have a good one.